All right, so are you ready to dive into the world of Elon Musk? I think so, yeah. I think everyone kind of thinks that they know who he is. Right. But he's kind of a hard guy to pin down. And today's episode, we're actually going to be taking a look at two different sources on him to try to understand him better. Yeah, we have Ashley Vance's biography, Elon Musk, Tesla, SpaceX, and the quest for a fantastic future. Mm -hmm. And we also have a more recent book by Tim Higgins called Power Play, Tesla, Elon Musk, and the Bet of the Century. I'm excited to dive in. Like, where do you even begin with this guy? Well, I think the best place to begin is at the beginning. Okay. With his childhood. All right. Take us back. So Musk was born in Pretoria, South Africa. Not exactly the typical Silicon Valley, you know. Yeah, I mean, he's not the typical anything. No, he's definitely not. Okay, so South Africa, tell us about his childhood. It was, uh, you know, kind of a difficult childhood. Both books kind of talk about his complicated family life. Okay. Even at a young age, though, you can see there were signs of his kind of unique way of thinking. Okay. I like that unique way of thinking. There's a great anecdote in the book about him explaining darkness to a scared child. Mm -hmm. And he just kind of matter-of-factly said that dark is merely the absence of light. It's so interesting because it's such a factual kind of like scientific way to explain something that is actually very emotional. Right. And it really highlights how Musk often approaches things from a very logical, almost literal perspective. Yeah. Even as a child, you can see that even then he wasn't quite connecting with people in the same way. Yeah. He retreated into books and computers. He even started building model rockets. All signs, yes, all signs pointing towards, you know, yeah. What he would become. Future space cadet, right? Yeah. But he did make a pretty big move at 17. Didn't he move to Canada? He did, yeah. He moved to Canada really as a stepping stone to getting to the United States. You know, he didn't want to do mandatory military service in South Africa at the time. Right. Which he saw as, you know, supporting the apartheid regime. So he was like, no, I'm out of here. Yeah. America. The land of the free, home of the brave and Silicon Valley. Exactly. So that that desire to kind of forge his own path is evident even at that early age. Yeah, that's a big decision to make at 17. Yeah. That is leaving your family and your home right. behind. So he makes it to America, starts yeah. interning at a bank. That's not very Elon Musk, is it? The banking thing? Well, he wasn't exactly a typical intern either. What do you mean? Like, there's a story about how he tried to convince his bosses to invest in South American debt. Really? He thought there was this opportunity to make billions. Okay, so already you're seeing those signs. Right. Of, like, the big ideas. Yeah. And thinking outside the box. Yeah, and they weren't really interested. And I think that kind of solidified his belief that, you know, these traditional institutions are kind of slow and bureaucratic. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, if you really want to get things done, you got to do them yourself. Okay, so you can almost see the formation of the Elon Musk we know today. Right. Starting to emerge even in that kind of setting. Yeah. So then how do we go from banking intern to founder of Zip2? That was his first company, Oops, right? right. Like explain what Zip2 even was because most people probably have no idea. So in the early days of the Internet, it was like an online business directory, almost like a digital yellow pages. Okay. Which is kind of funny because it sounds so quaint now. Right. But it was revolutionary at the time. It was. It was. I mean, they were literally driving around with a huge PC case trying to make their technology seem more impressive than it really was at the time. So fake it till you make it. Exactly. Classic startup story. Yeah. But the this samurai mentality of his, you know, I read about him saying that he was willing to commit seppuku if Zip2 failed. Like, was he always this intense? It seems so, yeah. He was incredibly driven, working insane hours, expected everyone around him to do the same. So... Not the most fun boss to work for, maybe. Probably not. But hey, results matter, right? And Zip2 did get sold for a pretty hefty sum. What was it, $300 million? $307 million. To Compoc, <laughs> yeah. Not a bad return on investment. <laughs> That's a life-changing amount of money. Absolutely. But for Elon Musk, it was just the beginning. Right. Yeah. That sale was like a rocket booster for his ambition. It gave him the resources and the confidence to think even bigger. Exactly. And that's where things get really interesting. Oh, yeah. Buckle up. Buckle up because... because we're just getting started. We're just getting started with the Elon Musk story. It really was a turning point for him. You know, most people would be happy to just kind of retire after a success like Zip2. Right. $307 million. I think I could figure out something to do with that. You'd think, right. No. Yeah. But for Musk, it was just like, okay... On to the next thing. On to bigger and better things. Exactly. And and for him, it was always about these 
these really grand challenges. Like, I mean, we're talking revolutionizing space travel, mm. reinventing the car. These are not small goals we're talking about. I mean, space exploration, the automotive industry, these are like the big leagues mm -hmm. dominated by these huge companies that have been around forever. Right. It's not like you're just disrupting some small niche market. No, not at all. He's going after these giants. And I think that says a lot about his personality. He's not afraid of a fight. Yeah, and I think both Vance and Higgins really make it clear in their books that for Musk, it's not about the money. It's not even about fame, really. So what is it about for him? I think he genuinely believes that he can change the world. He sees these big problems, climate change, the limitations of human technology, even the possibility of extinction, and he thinks he can solve them. It's a pretty heavy burden to carry. It is. I mean, both books are full of stories about him working these crazy hours, sleeping under his desk. Yeah, the guy's a machine, right? Yeah, I mean, you almost get tired just reading about it. But it's clear that this is a guy who is driven by something deeper than just profit or ego. Yeah, so let's talk about SpaceX. I mean, this is where it all really starts to take off. Right? Absolutely. So in 2001, not long after the Zip2 sale, Musk takes this almost surreal trip to Russia to try to buy ICBMs. ICBMs. Uh, the missiles, the ones with the nuclear warheads. Yeah, those. He had this idea that he could buy these decommissioned ICBMs from the Russians, refurbish them, and use them to launch rockets into space. I mean, on paper, it kind of makes sense. Right. It's like recycling on a massive scale. But did the Russians actually go for it? No. Yeah. They pretty much laughed him out of the room. They saw him as this, you know, naive Silicon Valley tech bro who had no idea what he was talking about. Which I'm sure only fueled his determination. He loves proving people wrong. Exactly. So Musk comes back to California, pockets a bit lighter, and decides, fine, I'll build my own damn rockets. And that's how SpaceX was born. And they're not exactly building these rockets in this garage, right? This is a massive undertaking. Oh, absolutely. The early days of SpaceX were just a constant struggle. Technical challenges, funding issues. I mean, they were literally on the verge of bankruptcy multiple times. It's incredible that they survived those early years. I mean, I, mean, yeah. I remember reading about the first three Falcon 1 launches, all ending in these spectacular explosions. It was brutal. Each failure cost millions of dollars. But Musk just kept pushing forward. He refused to give up even when everyone around him was telling him it was impossible. There's that story about how he had to choose between funding Tesla or SpaceX. Both companies were bleeding money, and he literally had to pick one to save. He was basically playing Russian roulette with his own fortune. It's a good thing he didn't put all his eggs in one basket, I guess. It is, because right after he made that decision, the next Falcon 1 launch was a success. In 2008, they became the first private company to successfully launch a rocket into orbit. It's like something out of a movie, the underdog coming from behind to win the big game. It was a huge turning point for SpaceX. It brought in new investors, it secured them contracts with NASA, and it proved to the world that private spaceflight was a viable option. But for Musk, reaching orbit was just the first step. Because the ultimate goal was reusable rockets, right? Exactly. He had this crazy idea that you could land the first stage of the rocket back on Earth intact so that you could use it again. Which sounds pretty much impossible. Like trying to land a skyscraper on a postage stamp. That's a pretty good analogy, actually. It took them years of trial and error, countless more explosions. But in 2015, they finally did it. They landed a Falcon 9 booster back on a drone ship in the ocean. That was a huge moment, not just for SpaceX, but for the entire space industry. It really showed that reusable rockets were a possibility. And that opened up a whole new era of possibilities for space exploration. Exactly. Suddenly, launching things into space was not only possible for private companies, but it was getting cheaper. And that changes everything. And they haven't slowed down since then, right? They're launching satellites, sending astronauts to the International Space Station. They even launched that Tesla Roadster into space. I mean, that was pure Elon Musk showmanship. But beyond those publicity stunts, they're also building these massive rockets, like the Starship, which is designed to eventually take humans to Mars. Which is still his ultimate goal, right? Building a self-sustaining colony on Mars. It's like something out of science fiction. It is, and it's a vision that a lot of people think is crazy, but you can't deny that he's making progress. Okay, so that's SpaceX, but what about Tesla? How did this electric car company go from being a fringe idea to being the most valuable car company in the world? That story seems just as improbable as landing a rocket on a barge in the middle of the ocean. 
It is. And in a lot of ways, it's even more complicated because with Tesla, you're not just dealing with technology. You're dealing with consumer behavior, government regulations, the entire automotive industry. It's a much more complex landscape. Yeah, like, okay, electric cars. Sounds cool, but will people actually buy them? Right. And in the early 2000s, electric cars were not exactly seen as cool. They were slow. They had limited range. They looked kind of dorky. Yeah, they were not exactly the car you'd see James Bond driving. Exactly. But Musk saw something different. He saw the potential for electric cars to not just be good for the environment, but also to be high performance, stylish, desirable. He wanted to make them the car that everyone wanted to drive. So basically, he wanted to turn the electric car from the nerdy kid in the corner to the prom king. That's a good way to put it. And I think that's what he did with the Tesla Roadster, their first production car. It was a sports car mm -hmm. based on a Lotus Elise, but with an electric powertrain that could go from zero to 60 in under four seconds. OK, so now we're talking. Yeah, suddenly electric cars weren't just for tree huggers. They were for people who wanted performance and style. But building a car company is hard really hard. I mean, it's not like building rockets is easy, but cars are like a whole other level of complexity. Oh, yeah. You're dealing with supply chains, manufacturing, regulations. It's a nightmare. And Tesla had a lot of daily problems. Production delays, cost overruns, battery fires. I mean, it was a mess. Yeah. Those fires were not good for PR. It played right into the hands of the critics who said electric cars were unsafe. It did. But Musk never gave up. He kept pushing his team to innovate to solve the problems, and they did. The Model S, which came out in 2012, was a game changer. It was a beautiful car with a long range and all these amazing features like the big touch screen and the over-the-air software updates. Yeah, the Model S was like the iPhone of cars. It oh. was stylish, it was high-tech, and it was easy to use. Exactly, and it was a huge success. It won tons of awards. It proved that electric cars could be luxurious and practical, but I think one of the most important things Tesla did was build out the supercharger network. Yeah, the superchargers, that was a really smart move. Before that, one of the biggest concerns people had about electric cars was range anxiety. You know, that fear of running out of battery in the middle of nowhere. So Tesla went out and built this network of fast charging stations all over the country. So you could actually take a road trip in a Tesla without having to worry about getting stranded. Exactly. It completely changed the game. And it gave Tesla a huge advantage over other car companies who were still trying to figure out this whole electric car thing. So Tesla goes from being this fringe idea to the most valuable car company in the world. Mm. But it wasn't always smooth sailing, was it? Oh, no, not at all. They had production problems, quality control issues, and they were constantly being attacked by the established automakers who were finally starting to realize that, that Tesla was a serious threat. And Musk himself was under a lot of pressure. He was running two groundbreaking companies at the same time, dealing with investors, regulators, the media. It's a miracle he didn't have a complete meltdown. It definitely took its toll, but he kept going. And Tesla continued to grow. They developed new models, expanded their manufacturing. And in 2020, they became the most valuable car company in the world. It's a pretty amazing story. Mm. But it's not over yet. They're still pushing the boundaries, mm. developing self-driving technology, new battery chemistries, even solar roofs. It's like they're trying to build the future one car at a time. Right. I mean, we haven't even talked about SolarCity, the boring company, Neuralink. Elon Musk never stops. It's true. The guy's got more ideas than he knows what to do with. So we're back talking about this guy, Elon Musk, and we still have so much more to talk about. Right. I'm not sure how one person can be involved in so many things, but he, he somehow seems to manage it. I know. I think that's one of the things that makes him so fascinating. Yeah. So let's talk about Solar City. This was his cousin's company, right? It was. Lyndon and Peter Rive. Okay. Were the co-founders, but Musk was involved from the very beginning both as an investor and chairman of the board. Okay, so it was kind of a family affair. In a way, yeah. But it also fit into Musk's larger vision. What do you mean? Well, he's always been very vocal about climate change. He sees sustainable energy as essential to the future of humanity. Right. And Solar City was a way to make solar energy more accessible to everyday people. Okay, so it wasn't just about making money. It was about making a difference. I think that's a big part of it. He wanted to create a world where everyone could have clean, affordable energy. But didn't Solar City eventually merge with Tesla? They did, yeah, in 2016. It was a controversial move at the time. Why controversial? Well, some investors saw it as a bailout. Fuller City was having some financial troubles. Okay. But others saw it as a strategic move, a way to create this vertically integrated sustainable energy company. Okay, so 
Tesla wouldn't just make electric cars. They would also provide the energy to power them. Right. It's a pretty compelling vision. It is, but let's be honest. Solar panels aren't exactly the most exciting thing in the world. True. I mean, even with Elon Musk behind them. And then there's the Boring Company, which honestly sounds like a joke. I know. It's hard to believe that it's a real company. So tell me he didn't actually start a tunneling company because he was stuck in traffic. That's pretty much exactly what happened. He was complaining about L.A. traffic on Twitter, <laughs> joking about building a tunnel boring machine, and then he just went and did it. Only Elon Musk could get away with that. Yeah. So what is the boring company actually trying to do? They want to develop these high-speed underground transportation systems to solve traffic congestion. So it's like a subway, but for cars. Kind of. The idea is that these electric vehicles would travel through tunnels at high speeds, mm. bypassing all the traffic above ground. Okay, so it's not just digging random holes in the ground. There's actually a plan here. There is. They've already built some test tunnels, and they're working on a project in Las Vegas that would connect the convention center to the Strip. Okay, so we've got solar energy, tunneling, electric cars, space travel. What else is there? Oh, yeah, Neuralink. Ah, yes. The Brain Computer Interface Company. This is the one where he wants to merge our minds with machines, right? That's the general idea. It's starting to sound a bit like a science fiction movie. It is. But they're actually making progress, aren't they? They are. They've developed these implantable devices that can record and stimulate brain activity. So what's the goal here? Like, what are they actually trying to achieve with this technology? Well, in the short term, they're focused on medical applications, helping people with paralysis or neurological disorders. Okay, that makes sense. But the long-term goal is much more ambitious. They want to create a brain-computer interface that can enhance human capabilities. Enhance human capabilities. Right. Like give us telepathy or superhuman intelligence. And I mean, those are the kind of sci-fi scenarios that people talk about. But even just the ability to seamlessly interact with computers using our thoughts would be revolutionary. It would, but it's also pretty scary, right? <laughs> I mean, imagine the potential for abuse. That's a valid concern. And Musk himself has talked about the risks of artificial intelligence becoming too powerful. Right. I think he sees Neuralink as a way to keep up with AI, to ensure that humans remain in control. Okay, so it's not just about making us smarter, it's about making sure we don't get left behind by our own creations. Exactly. So we've covered a lot of ground here. SpaceX, Tesla, SolarCity, the boring company Neuralink. It's almost too much to process. What does it all mean? What's the big takeaway from all this? Well, I think if there's one thing that all these ventures have in common, it's Elon Musk's unwavering belief in the power of technology. He's not afraid to tackle big problems, to push the boundaries of what's possible. And he's shown us that one person really can make a difference. Yeah, whether you love him or hate him, you can't deny that he's had a massive impact on the world. And he's not done yet. No, he's not. And that's what makes him so fascinating to watch. Who knows what he'll come up with next? That's the question, isn't it? What's next for Elon Musk? And what does that mean for the rest of us? I guess we'll just have to wait and see. But one thing's for sure, it's going to be an interesting ride. It always is. And that's it for our deep dive into the world of Elon Musk. We hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, be sure to subscribe to The Deep Dive for more explorations of fascinating people and ideas. We're always looking for new topics to dive into, so let us know what you'd like to hear about next. Until then, keep exploring.